It has been whispered about for months, but it was only over the end of June that it finally became official. Longtime leader of the Netherlands, Mark Rutte, uh, will be the next head of NATO. Taking over when the current Secretary General, Jens Stoltenberg, steps down on October the 1st, Rutte will inherit an alliance battling threats both internal and external. On its eastern flank, Russia is threatening to destabilize smaller members like Estonia and Lithuania. Across the Atlantic, officials fear that a return of Trump could see America's commitment to NATO fade. Meanwhile, the persistent failure of several nations to meet their spending commitments, <coughs> Canada, threatens to undermine deterrence. In short, the new Secretary General will have his work cut out for him. All of which is why it's important to try and figure out one thing. Who really is Mark Rutte? On the surface, that's an easy question to answer. The Netherlands' longest-serving modern leader, Rutte, is known as a pragmatist and a dealmaker. But we're interested in the deeper truth here. What kind of man is he? And are his qualities of the kind that will unite the NATO alliance, or see it at long last fade into irrelevance? Not so long ago, it seemed like the post of NATO Secretary General was on the cusp of a great transformation. After decades being held by men from the same small group of Western and mostly Northern European countries, there was a feeling that the job needed to migrate east. That the next holder, after current incumbent Jen Stoltenberg, should hail from one of the nations that joined after the end of the Cold War. Not only that, but there were also rumblings that it was time to break the mold of middle-aged white men that maybe a woman should hold the post. As Estonian Prime Minister Kaja Kallas recently joked about the process, the thinking went that, quote, the next Secretary General should be from a new member state, should definitely be from a country that has spent at least 2% of their GDP on defense, and it would be nice if it would be a woman. So it's logical that it should be Mark Rutte. Although Callas was speaking in jest, her words underscored a serious point. The ascent of Mark Rutte to the head of the alliance was everything NATO claimed not to want. The fourth Dutchman to take the role, the head of a government that oversaw deep spending cuts on defense, taking it down to a pitiful 1.1% of GDP. And yet, when Rutte threw his hat in the ring, his coronation took on an air of inevitability. After telling herself he was looking for something different, it turned out that a pragmatic conservative from the Netherlands was what NATO had secretly wanted all along. That's not to say that there wasn't any logic to the decision. As the person at the head of a military grouping of 32 nations, the Secretary General's role is to balance opinions and find consensus, a vital skill when any country could deploy its veto at any moment. As such, it's a role Dutch politicians are ideally suited for, coming as they do from a nation in which parliamentary majorities are unheard of and does anyone want Wanting to get anything done needs to be skilled at building coalitions and making deals. Yet even among political players in the Netherlands, Rutte excels in these fields. In his 14 years as Prime Minister, the longest tenure in Dutch history, he forged coalitions that spanned all the way from the centre-left to the hard-right. Famously, the arithmetic was so complex after the 2017 election that it took 225 days to put a government together, and yet Rutte succeeded in the end. In Brussels too, he's known as the man who forged the 2015 deal with President Erdogan in which Turkey agreed to take in refugees in return for vast sums of EU money. As the New Statesman has written, Rutte's ability to unlock deals is his political trademark. This consensus building was visible on his path to the Secretary General job. After twice turning down offers from Washington to take over from Jens Stoltenberg, foreign policy writes that Rutte told Joe Biden in January of 2023, You have asked me twice to become Secretary General of NATO, and I turned you down twice. If you ask me a third time, I will say yes. But while America's backing was essential, it was in convincing the holdout nations of Turkey and Hungary that Rutte really shined. Having long pissed off Erdogan by not condemning Dutch politicians who insulted him, Rutte spent the spring traveling to Turkey and alternately flattering and reassuring the autocrat who ultimately gave him his blessing. Perhaps more impressively, Rutte managed to get Viktor Orban on side despite the two having a long track record of loathing one another. In 2021, Rutte had even said Hungary should no longer be in the EU for its anti-LGBT policies, a comment the prickly Orban seemed unlikely to forgive him for. And yet, when the time came, Rutte was able to convince the Hungarian leader to back him. Partially this was by apologizing for his 2021 comments, but it was also by agreeing to a Hungarian opt-out for any NATO activities in Ukraine. It was a classic bit of Rutte deal-making, the sort of pragmatic hunt for areas of compromise that few other candidates would have been capable of pulling off. But it also sums up both the potential strengths and weaknesses of the new Secretary General. His ability to hold unlikely alliances together, but also his apparent flexibility with his principles. Qualities that have been visible throughout his entire political career.
At 194 centimeters tall, or 6'4 in American units, Ruta oh, was long the giants among European leaders, a guy who stood out even in a crowd of Dutchmen. Yet if his tallness set Ruta apart from the others, it was perhaps the only conspicuous thing about him. In almost all other respects, the future Secretary General spent most of his time in Dutch politics trying to be as low-key as humanly possible. Some of this involved habits that are today legendary, such as riding his bike to work and continuing to teach one day a week at a local high school even after becoming PM. Others would be unthinkable in America or Britain, such as refusing a security detail until 2021. Other habits, though, suggest a man who loves routines almost as much as he hates surprises. As Politico wrote in a 2023 profile, Ruta's routine hasn't changed for the better part of a decade. He sips his weekend cappuccino at the same cafe, visits the same hairdresser, eats at the same handful of restaurants, and tends to order the same meal. When he visits Brussels, Ruta doesn't just stay in the same hotel, he books the same room. Others have reported how he takes the same vacations at the same times every year, including a short break in New York where he always meets the same friends and always goes to the same restaurant. The investigative journalism outlet Follow the Money has written about how much breaking routine stresses Ruta out, quoting here, He is attached to routines and subject to mild panics if these are deviated from. The mere possibility of losing control threatens outbursts of anger, for which he then immediately apologizes. However, this is only in day-to-day -day life. In politics, most are in agreement that Ruta suffers from no such inflexibility, seeming to thrive on changing to suit his needs. An old friend once memorably described him as a wet soap that no one can get a grip on. To illustrate, foreign policy points to the ways in which Ruta seemed to change his convictions to suit the different coalitions he worked with. Or, as the magazine put it, during the four Dutch governing coalitions he formed, both with left-wing and very right-wing parties, insiders were often struck by the ease with which Ruta made compromises, especially when negotiations were at breaking point. To him, compromises were often preferable to principles. Now, for those of us who grew up in political cultures that value principled stance, such chameleon-like behavior can perhaps seem untrustworthy. After all, should the head of NATO really be someone so slippery, so unknowable? For some, the answer is a resounding yes. In an otherwise mildly critical piece, the New Statesman suggests that being able to quickly adapt to changing circumstances might be useful in today's uncertain world. To quote them, at a time when NATO needs to reinvent itself to survive the growing fragmentation it faces both from within and from outside the alliance, it will find at its helm a master of reinvention. It's stuff like this that makes Ruta such an interesting choice. The way his qualities can be seen as both an advantage and a hindrance, depending on who is looking. Take his infamous ability to survive scandals without a scratch, an ability that earned him the nickname of Teflon Mark. In 2021, for example, the discovery that the Dutch government had branded thousands of ordinary parents fraudsters for claiming child benefit they were legally entitled to collapsed Ruta's coalition. An election was called only for Ruta to lead his party to victory again. Perhaps less admirably, Follow the Money highlights his skill at saying things that seem untrue without ever actually lying. Once, when confronted with documents he had appeared to say didn't exist, Ruta peevishly corrected his accusers with the comment, I did not say that there are no documents, but that I have no recollection of those documents. Again, depending on your standpoint, this sort of behavior could be categorized as that of a clever hustler, a slippery politician, or just a guy who is an expert at getting out of trouble. So will having a man like that at the top of NATO be good or bad for the alliance? And it's easy to find arguments both for and against. So far, though, we've mostly focused on Ruta's general character, but this is a channel focused on things related to the military and geopolitics. So it's time for us to dig a little deeper into Ruta's time in office, taking in both his approach to defense policy as well as his actions regarding one of the most important conflicts of our time, the war in Ukraine. From the perspective of pro-NATO Americans, perhaps the best thing about having Ruta as Secretary General is his renowned ability to get on with both Republicans and Democrats. During Donald Trump's presidency, Ruta became one of the few European leaders the Republican genuinely seemed to like. Both on a personal level, the two traded good-natured barbs about the size of their desks, but also on a professional one. Ruta, for example, is credited with helping to hold the alliance together in 2018 when Trump was mulling an American withdrawal. At a time when Merkel and Macron were arguing with the president over spending figures, Ruta was the only one willing to praise Trump and give him credit for pushing Europe to do more for its own defense. Charmed by Ruta's easygoing manner, Trump afterwards told a press conference that they'd made tremendous progress at the meeting. The threat of America pulling out of NATO passed, and Ruta earned himself the nickname 
the Trump whisperer. Clearly, having such a guy in the top job will be a major advantage for the alliance if Trump wins in November. Yet the strangest part is that Ruta should really be the sort of European head of state that Trump despises. After all, it was on Ruta's watch that Dutch defense spending plunged to a miserable low of 1.1% of GDP. Since the 2014 summit in Wales, it has been NATO policy for every member to spend 2% of GDP on defense, with an exception for Iceland, which doesn't have a military. As you'll probably recall, getting European nations to jack up their spending to hit the target was an obsession of Donald Trump's. Yet Ruta led his government in the exact opposite direction. As a way of dealing with the aftermath of the financial crisis, Ruta oversaw a round of savage military cuts that didn't just slice defense spending to the bone, but soared right through it to the marrow. While many of these cuts took place before the 2014 summit, the record low of 1.1% came the year after. And you better believe these cuts had a hard impact on Dutch military capabilities. Here's how the Kiev Independent described the effects. In 2015, a shortage of ammunition meant that many soldiers were training without bullets, with some resorting to making a bang noise to simulate their weapon being fired. Continued budget cutbacks and personnel shortages led one former general to describe the state of the Dutch military as being sick and on an IV drip. Now, to be fair to Ruta, he reversed these cuts after the Russian invasion of Ukraine, setting a 2% spending target for the Netherlands. But by then, the damage had been done. As we've seen with many other nations that slash defense spending, it's not so simple as turning the money tap back on and suddenly having a top-class military ready to go. It can take years, or even decades, to reverse the hollowing out caused by such cuts. And there is no doubt that hollow is what the Dutch military now is. Here's how former army commander Marta de Kroef explains it to RTL News, quoting, We lack firepower on land, sea, and in the air. For Americans frustrated by European free riding, this should be the textbook example of a country that foolishly hobbled its own defense industry. And it was all done, not just on Ruta's watch, but with his enthusiastic approval. Still, we don't want this section to be purely focused on defense spending. After all, the most immediate challenge Ruta will face when he takes over as Secretary General is the war currently raging in Ukraine. And here, at least, Ruta is more in tune with the majority of the alliance. As the Kiev Independent writes, The Netherlands has emerged as a reliable partner for Kiev, taking the lead with initiatives like providing F-16 planes to Ukraine. The Netherlands has also allocated $4.35 billion in military aid to Ukraine, fifth overall. The fact that Ruta led a pro-Ukraine government shouldn't be surprising. After all, he was prime minister in July of 2014 when Russia-backed rebels in eastern Ukraine shot down Malaysia Airlines flight MH17, killing all aboard. Of the 298 victims, nearly 200 were Dutch citizens. Those close to Ruta say this is one of the few times they ever saw him lose it. The Dutchman is said to have discarded his usual pragmatism and berated Vladimir Putin, demanding the remains of all Dutch citizens be returned diplomatic relations with Russia were sent into the deep freeze. So yeah, perhaps it's unsurprising that Mark Rutter became a staunch backer of Ukraine after the full-scale invasion, providing Leopard 2 tanks and promising F-16 fighter jets. Yet even following the downing of MH17, that streak of pragmatism and compromise remained. In their recent profile, Follow Money revealed that behind the scenes, Ruta's government lobbied Brussels in favor of the controversial Nord Stream 2 pipeline that was intended to bring huge quantities of Russian gas to Germany. With hindsight, we can now see that Nord Stream 2 was part of the Kremlin's attempt to create the conditions for energy blackmail should Europe ever try to sanction Moscow. To Ruta's discredit, this was something Eastern nations like Poland had been warning about for years. And it's here that we get uh, one of the big controversies about Ruta's elevation to Secretary General. The feeling in some Eastern parts of the alliance that, despite MH17, he is still too soft on Russia. Alright, back in Chapter 1, we mentioned the way Estonian Prime Minister Kaja Kalas joked about Ruta's accession to the NATO job. Yet Kalas' sense of humor seems to have masked a deeper annoyance. In an appearance with French media, the Estonian seemed to speak for many states living closer to Russia when she said, Our fear is that he was Prime Minister for a long time, and the Netherlands has not lived up to this commitment of 2% of GDP in defense. She also expressed exasperation that NATO top jobs were still reserved for a small number of countries. 
a fact that is hard to argue with. While the Alliance's current Deputy Secretary General is Romanian, all seven Assistant Secretary Generals are from either Western Europe or the United States. Despite joining NATO 20 years ago, or even longer in the case of Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic, Eastern nations are still underrepresented at the highest ranks. Now, you could dismiss Callis's position as sour grapes. After all, she wanted that job for herself, but was considered too hawkish on Russia for some Western European members. On the other hand, you could say that she's channeling the frustrations of many in Europe's East. For years, these countries warned everyone else about Moscow's intentions. They warned nations like the Netherlands not to cut defense spending. Warned countries like Germany not to get addicted to Russian gas. Now they've been proven right and they feel they deserve some credit. This is at least partially why Romanian President Klaus Johannes campaigned for the post against the Ruta. After an endless age in which Western Europe slashed military spending and cozied up to Russia, how could the leader of such a country be convincing as the head of NATO? To be fair, this sort of criticism of Ruta only plays well in certain countries. And the fact Estonia or Romania didn't block his bid for the top job suggests that these flaws are far from fatal. However, there are other controversies around Ruta that focused more on his time in government. Specifically, how he may have put his own desire to get the Secretary General job above the needs of his country. Politico notes how Ruta made several abrupt U-turns in his last months in office, flipping from long-held Dutch positions on certain subjects to ones seemingly designed to mollify his NATO critics. Back in December, for example, he suddenly dropped a Dutch veto on Romania and Bulgaria, joining Europe's free movement Schengen zone. In the aftermath of October 7th, the Netherlands also participated in strikes on the Houthis, a move some said was intended to buy Ruta support in Washington. Here's how Politico put it. At home in the Netherlands, critics already suspect Ruta of using Dutch foreign policy to boost his chances for the NATO job. Foreign policy went even further. In what was otherwise a fairly flattering profile, the magazine suggested that Ruta may have deliberately collapsed his coalition government in summer of 2023 to ensure he'd be available for the Secretary General post. As the article tells it, the consummate dealmaker stunned his coalition allies when he refused to back down or compromise on a single small issue. Weirder still was that when an agreement was within reach, Ruta got very annoyed, dug in, and then dissolved the government. Others were stunned, as this was both unnecessary and very unlike him. For once, apparently, Ruta actually wanted the government to fail. In the context of the article, this anecdote is meant to show how Ruta is always planning ahead. If true, though, it would suggest that he dynamited the government and risked political stability at home for a more powerful job abroad. Still, while these controversies are worth mentioning, they're not the only considerations. After all, what's arguably more important than past problems is how Secretary General Ruta will deal with future ones. Because make no mistake, the future of NATO is one that's going to be filled with challenges. For anyone other than Ruta in the top job, it's likely that NATO's greatest fear would be what happens on November 5th. On that day, there's a decent chance that American voters could hand Donald Trump another term. Given the 45th president's previous track record saying Russia should be free to do or whatever the hell it likes to countries that don't hit the 2% spending threshold, this would legitimately be a NATO nightmare. But as we noted earlier, Ruta may be one of the only people in Europe capable of handling the Donald. Already, he seems to be laying the groundwork, doing things like telling other leaders on the continent to stop moaning, whining, and nagging about Trump. Trump, something Trump is likely to appreciate. In fact, the Atlantic Council even argues that Ruta may be the guy to keep a re-elected Trump loyal to NATO. In their words, allies feel confident that Ruta is the key to Trump-proofing the alliance. Still, even if a re-elected Trump retains his soft spot for Ruta and keeps up his commitment to NATO, challenges do lie ahead. While Washington still views Russia as a threat, Moscow is no longer the biggest foe America faces. As the new Cold War heats up with China, the US is going to have no choice but to refocus on the Indo-Pacific at Europe's expense. Or as foreign policy puts it, Europe will need to take over far more of the challenges of meeting the threat from Russia diplomatically and militarily. The United States can help, but not as much as Europe is accustomed to. For NATO, this shifting of US attention will be a huge challenge. Not because all the other members are pathetically weak – France, Britain, Poland, and Finland are all decent mid-sized militaries, for example. Rather, it's because there are key capabilities, such as heavy lift, that only the Americans can provide at scale. Even if every single nation were to start spending 3% of their GDP on defense, these are not things that can be replaced overnight. 
Speaking of defense spending, Aruta's other great challenge will be to stamp out free riding. While a record number of NATO nations have now hit the 2% thresholds, 23 out of 32, some are still committed laggards. Italy, Spain, Belgium, and Canada all spend less than 1.5%. If a gigantic war on NATO's doorstep can't convince them to spend more, it's hard to see how Ruta alone might be able to. And finally, there's the ever-present threat of Russia. With Putin's army currently bogged down in Ukraine, it's unlikely that there will be an invasion of the Baltic states or Poland in the next few years. But that doesn't mean the Kremlin won't test the boundaries. At the very least, defense ministers and security experts warn the Russians may try to destabilize smaller nations like Lithuania using gray zone tactics, seeing how far they can push hybrid warfare without risking a military backlash. In short, the new Secretary General is going to face some mammoth tasks in his post. Whether he'll be up to it is something that we'll just have to wait and see. As this video has made clear, the real Mark Rutte is an elusive figure. We can say that he's a pragmatist, that he's ruthlessly ambitious, and that he's good at keeping people on side and building consensus. That alone may be enough to hold NATO together through what will doubtless be a difficult decade. But only time will tell if the Alliance made the right choice in appointing him as its latest leader.